Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for Hanger Clinic's virtual classroom series designed for medical professionals. This virtual classroom idea truly was inspired by so many of you all reaching out and looking for creative ways for our teams to continue to engage during this time. So we hope you enjoy this session and any others you may have signed up for. So let's get started. I want to introduce a few folks that we'll have joining us throughout the series. If you've attended a few other sessions already, you may have met some of us. So this is mainly for our first timers. First, we've got me. I am Lily Comrath. I am the professional education manager turned Zoom GoToWebinar, very semi-expert. And I manage all things education for Hanker Clinic. Next, we've got Mike Gano, a DC area manager. And lastly, we have Mike Benny, our patient partner, ambassador, leader, and pro speaker who makes it all look easy. And the only one of us that really knows how to uh, public speak. So um, he's gonna, <laughs> there you are. Hey guys, make, make it look super easy for everyone. All right, thanks guys so much for joining us. And you may actually see them um, answering some questions that come through as well. So you'll see their name pop up also. All right. So just a few housekeeping items there to review with you all. You should see your control panel on the right hand side. From there, you'll be able to adjust your experience. Um, you can use the orange arrow to toggle the control panel back and forth. You can even adjust your webcam view. So if you want to make your slides a little bit larger or maybe the webcam view a little bit bigger too, you can do that through that control panel. We do not have any handouts for you guys today. We will have them though um, for you guys. Uh, uh, after the session via a link. Questions. So posting questions there on the right hand side. You are able to post questions there on the right hand side via that control panel. We'll be monitoring those questions for you guys as well. CE contact hours for this course. So if you did sign up, you will receive an email communication with links to submit your credit request and complete the course evaluation for your certificate. And you'll see that from me. Um, you know, hopefully I'll get that out to you guys tomorrow. That'll just be a simple credit request form for our CTs, our, our OMP folks. There is a quiz attached to that though. So just FYI on that one. All right, over to our disclosure statement here. So many of our speakers for our virtual classroom are clinicians for Hanger Clinic. And our speaker today practices out of one of our Portland, Oregon clinics. All right, so let's get started and into our session. Restoring mobility and building a patient-focused future using big data. And I'm excited to introduce our speaker for the session. Not only is she an amazing clinician, but she's a fellow Portlander. I'm up here in Portland as well. Um, and we both really enjoy the rain. <laughs> right, Erin? <laughs> um, uh, sure. Erin so O'Brien. <laughs> Erin O'Brien has been with Hanger for 11 years, first in Houston, Texas, and now in Portland, Oregon. She's a graduate of University of Washington, where she completed a bachelor's degree in orthotics and prosthetics in 2008. She specializes in care for pediatric patients and for patients with upper limb amputation or limb deficiency. Her time is currently split between clinic and the Department of Clinical and Scientific Affairs, where she works on research projects to improve patient outcomes. Thank you so much for joining us today, Erin. And the floor is all yours. All right. Thanks, guys. Good to see everybody. Thanks so much for being here today. Before we really jump in, I would love to know who we actually have on the call. So, Lily, can you run that poll for me? Yeah, sure. All right, guys. So, we're going to launch this poll here. Let's see who do we have out there. All right. Poll launched. Who do we have out there today? So go ahead. Are you an OMP clinician, a physical therapist, a physician, researcher, a nurse? If you don't see yours identified there, then feel free to type that into the question box and I want to see who's um, who's out there today. Oh, great. So we've got good responses. Perfect, perfect. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. I'm going to share the results with you guys. Oh, all right, Erin, so it looks like you have 29% OMP clinicians out okay. there today, 55% physical therapists. 
Uh, you've got some physicians, 3% here, 6% researcher, and a few nurses at 7%. So you've got a great crowd here. All awesome. Right. Should be a good group then. Okay. So let's jump into the actual content of this presentation. And so we're going to start with Hanger's mission statement. And our mission is to empower human potential. And that can actually happen on a multitude of sort of dimensions. The first one we're going to talk about is on an individual level. And so I think all of us think about that way when we're in, a, in the clinic working one-on-one -on -one with a patient. We're working to help that specific patient reach their potential. But it's not quite as easy as just for, for us as prosthetists, just giving them a prosthesis and saying, okay, there you go, you can meet your goals, go for it. We really have to look at helping that patient identify their goals and then figure out how to get from where those goals are to actually reaching those goals. And so through that process, that's empowering that person. And so it's not about necessarily walking faster. It's not necessarily about taking longer or more even strides. It's not even about picking up a, a block from a box and moving it from one to the other. It's about focusing on life outcomes. So life outcomes could be a number of different things, and you can see a whole list here. It could be employment, it could be managing their pain, so a whole bunch of different things, but those are real things that we need to focus on with our patients. But we can also look at empowering patients on a community level. And so that's where, you know, Hanger is kind of uniquely positioned because we do have such a large reach that we can start to look at the community of patients and not just the individuals. So when we look at a community, we need to make sure that we're helping patients get the necessary devices that will empower them and make sure that they have access to those resources. You know, so how do we actually do that? That sounds great, in, but in practice, you know, what do we do? Um, well, we started collecting outcomes um, and we started on you know in a, a fairly small number of clinics back in april of 2016 so it's been over four years now and we actually have now over 75,000 data points that we can point to and start to look at to empower our population on the community level so many times our payers and our policymakers don't really understand the day-to-day -day lives of our patients, and they don't really understand how our devices impact those lives. So they may make decisions on a policy level that don't really actually help our patients. They may actually hinder our patients. So if we can, you know, publish some of our data, we can help get that information out into the community. And, and at Hangar, we actually feel that we have a moral obligation to share this information with our groups so that this information gets out and we can actually start to affect change. So we are creating a culture of outcomes that drive patient success. And you can see here, there we go. Um, you know, this is kind of an outline, an overview of how, how our outcomes programs work. So we call it the ME program or Mobility Empowerment Program. Um, and it's data-driven, evidence-based. And it's really, we're monitoring our, and trying to improve our patient outcomes. So the patient schedule an appointment, they fill out a standard outcomes form. We talk to them about what that outcomes form looks like, what, what scores they have, and establish their baseline on the first appointment. And then we share that scorecard with them. And during that collection, we actually are getting some demographic information as well, of course. Um, and you can see on the right side in the orange what some of those things that we're collecting are. Along with that, we have some reliable and validated measures that we're using to collect some information. So on the left, you can see the plus M. It was actually developed specifically for prosthesis users, and it, compare, it allows a comparison of mobility across different groups, so maybe a transfemoral versus a transtibial patient, and also across time, so the same patient now versus six months from now versus two years from now. A T-score, just so you guys know, we're gonna be talking about T-scores a lot, a T-score of 50 out of 100 is an average level, and people can score, of course, above or below that, and it's available for free as a resource. Um, the PEQ is the process Prosthesis Evaluation Questionnaire, and we're focusing on the well-being subset of those questions. It's a very long survey. We don't want to burden our patients with too many um, questions, so actually all we're asking them is one question on quality of life and one question on satisfaction since their amputation, and those are scored out of 10. And that allows us to create what we call a ME scorecard, Mobility Empowerment Scorecard. And you can see this one on the left-hand side. 
this person has a couple different mobility assessments on different dates, and you can see that that trend is increasing. That's great. That's what we want for all of our patients. Um, on the right side top, you can see that that mobility is compared to similar prosthesis users. So these are similar in amputation level, etiology, and age group. We can kind of compare them in a little bit smaller group. And then on the bottom right, you can see satisfaction and quality of life. So that mobility scorecard enables people on a personal level. We can talk one-on-one -on -one with our patient and say, this is where you were, and this is where you are, and this is where we want you to be heading. And we can actually show them that in a graphic rep representation by giving them that scorecard. But again, we have a moral obligation to do something with that data that can help on the community level. And that's where these studies come in. So the mobility analysis of amputees, MAAT studies, are the ones that we're actually going to be talking about today. And there are a series of studies that are going to look to disseminate information regarding mobility and associated domains of quality of life and satisfaction. Those are the, basically the three things we're going to be talking about today. Mobility, quality of life, and satisfaction on patients with lower limb prostheses. So across the bottom, you can see all six of them have been published in peer-reviewed journals. First one was published in 2017, and the newest one was actually just published in February of 2020. So let's get started on MAT1. Quality of life and satisfaction are strongly related for, to mobility for patients with a lower limb prosthesis. The title kind of gives it away in this case. Um, but if we think about it, you know, all of us in clinics think that we have an idea of how mobility relates to a patient's quality of life. But despite all that belief, there wasn't actually any scientific evidence, there was no empirical evidence that backed that up. So we have the ability to do that. So what we did was we looked at a retrospective analysis of all those outcomes that we had been collecting, and we were able to look at those relationships with 509 patients with lower limb prosthesis. That's a big number for prosthetics and orthotics. If you're familiar with prosthetics and orthotics research, 509 patients is a lot of patients to be able to include in a study. And you'll see as we go along, as our database got bigger, our studies actually got bigger as well. So we plotted quality of life and satisfaction versus their plus MT score, it's pretty straightforward. But all we're looking at is how does the mobility, the plus MT score, correlate with quality of life and how does it correlate with satisfaction? So when we plotted these, it was pretty obvious that there was a strong positive relationship with mobility for quality of life and satisfaction. So as a patient's mobility got better, their quality of life got better and their satisfaction got better. That's great news for us. So what does that mean? That means if we're looking at a patient holistically with lower limb loss, we need to make sure that we are maximizing mobility because that's going to correlate with greater quality of life and greater general satisfaction for that patient. So kind of a big picture study to start off with, but you got to do the background work first, right? We have to establish there's, there's a connection between those two before we can move on. Okay, so MAT2. So this one has to do with comorbid health and mobility and how do those reflect on each other. So you know, there's some confusion in healthcare, and rightfully so, about how a patient's comorbid health affects their mobility. And sometimes there's misconceptions surrounding that maybe somebody with a lot of healthcare conditions might have a lower potential for ambulation. So are those reasonable assumptions, or are they just observed realities, or maybe they're misconceptions? So again, we went back to our data and we were able to look at 596 patients. We looked at their functional comorbidities index. This is part of the data that we collect on patients. And it's just a group of 18 specific comorbidities that the patient can check or the prosthetist can check to say that they do or don't have that condition. And then we looked at their mobility, of course, from the plus M. So these are the FCI. The, uh, the comorbidities on the FCI. And you can see next to them in the parentheses the number of patients with each of those conditions that were included in the study. Okay, so if we look at mobility and comorbid health, there are actually only four significant predictors for mobility. Those were age, history of stroke, presence of PVD, and a history of anxiety and panic disorder. So of all those 18 predictors, these are the only four that actually had significance, statistical significance, in terms of affecting someone's mobility. But patients that had peripheral vascular disease and those that are aged 65 and over did have a statistically significant difference, but their clinically significant difference minimum number was not reached. So in terms of the plus M, your score has to change by about four and a half points 
for it to be a clinically significant difference in mobility. And those two groups of people did not have that large of a change. Um, and really notably, conditions like arthritis, COPD, congestive heart failure, and even diabetes were not significant predictors. So we look at this graphically, we have two graphs here. On the left-hand side, you can see the mobility and comorbid health in a whole bunch of different colors. So what that is, is these are the groups that we studied, and we grouped them by how many comorbid conditions they had. So on the far left-hand side in the blue bar, that's zero comorbid conditions. These are our healthiest patients. And then it goes all the way down to greater than six comorbid conditions. So these people have a lot of things going on with them. And we looked at that, and you can see, yes, as the comorbidities increase, the number of comorbidities increase, their mobility gets lower. But if you look at the graph on the right-hand side with all the green bars, you can actually see that these are those same groups of people if we control for the effects of those other four noted predictors. So if we wipe out the cause and effect of those four other conditions that we already went over, you can see that all of those groups still fall within the clinically significant difference range. And so really, patients are maintaining their mobility even with increased numbers of comorbidity. So there are predictors that we can look at that can show us what, what you might expect for mobility. Age, history of stroke, peripheral vascular disease, and anxiety and panic disorders were the significant predictors. But when we look at it again, the patients with peripheral vascular disease and those over age 65 still are maintaining really good mobility levels, and they're within the minim minimally clinically significant difference. That's hard to say. Um, but um, we might want to look more closely at certain patient populations when we're talking about their mobility and a prosthesis. Those with a history of stroke and those with a history of anxiety and panic disorders do have a difference in terms of their mobility um, when we looked at it with their comorbidity. But overall, their comorbid health is not as much of a factor as, as the, um, for the patient's mobility as we originally maybe thought it was. So, you know, if you have a patient that has a stroke, you're going to have probably a fairly large impact on their mobility with their prosthesis. But, it, you know, there's also a difference between a patient that has maybe diabetes and mild peripheral vascular disease um, and has had an amputation and, there, and a person that's had fairly severe peripheral vascular disease and um, with diabetes and is in end-stage renal failure. Those are two entirely different patients. Certainly, the patient with end-stage renal failure is going to have a lower mobility than the one with mild PDP. But we need to make sure that we're not prejudging these patients when we look at what their mobility level is with, compared with their comorbid health. My dog's getting in on the action here. Hopefully, you guys can't hear her too much. She's very excited about MAP studies. So we're going to move on to MAT3, which is where the, I think the studies get really, really interesting. So this is where we got, get into studies that prosthetists, PTs, physicians, we can actually start to have an impact on our patients' lives. Some of the other studies were just studying, you know, kind of what's already there, things that we don't necessarily have um, control over. But this is where we start to see something that we can actually impact. So this is on advanced prosthetic knee components, improving function. And these are results from patients matched for comorbid health. So when we look at microprocessor needs, there are all sorts of studies out there that already exist that talk about the levels of functionality and the levels of safety and how much a patient's life can be improved by using a microprocessor knee. But we still have a really hard time in certain cases getting them paid for by our patients, uh, for our patients, excuse me, um, because maybe payers aren't understanding the studies that are out there, maybe they're not strong enough studies, but we need to continue to provide more and more information to make the case for microprocessor needs because all of us know that they really are better technology for the patients. Um, and so is it possible that technology can bridge the gap between an above knee amputation and a below knee amputation for a patient that has that technology? So this is kind of fun. We use the functional comorbidity index to sort of level the playing field. If you think about studying um, above knee amputees, you can get all sorts of confounding variables that might make it really hard to determine what's making a difference in this patient's life. Is it just that they're healthier? Is it that they have technology? What is it? So what we did was we grouped all of our um, data into three categories. We looked at non-microprocessor knee users that were AKs. 
We looked at AKs that were microprocessor knee users, and then we had BK amputees. We ranked all of them. We put them in order of overall health using our functional comorbidity index. And then we took the most healthy 150 people from the non-microprocessor knee user group. We had a range then for the FCI. And then we used that same range of FCI and age to select 150 patients from the microprocessor knee user group and the BK group. So we're controlling for their overall health and their age. The things that we have left in a big sense are what level of amputation is that this patient, which we don't really have any control over, and then what technology does that patient have? And if you look at the graph that's on the right side, the non-microprocessor knee users, as we would expect, have the lowest mobility. The BK users, again, as we would expect, have the highest mobility, and there are significant differences between each of these groups. But the one that's in the middle, the microprocessor knee users, you can see they've almost bridged the gap. So they're halfway between non-microprocessor knee users and BK users. And that's a big deal because again, we've controlled for age, we've controlled for overall health, and we can't control for amputation level, but that's the other kind of variable here. So the only thing that's making that change that we think is the type of technology that they have. So we know that patients with a microprocessor knee perform better than their peers with above knee amputation that do not have a microprocessor knee. And so advancements in technology are kind of closing the gap between BKs and AKs. And that's a really big deal because we, we always kind of expect our AK patients to have slightly hey, lower mobility. Yes. Hey, sorry about that. We can hear that's your okay. pup. Um, I know she's super excited about Matt, but she's, um, yeah. she's coming through and not being able to hear you as much. Would you be okay. able to, I don't know. I could throw can, her out, yep. Um, Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Aw, there she goes. <laughs> Thanks so much. Sorry no, about that, guys. I, I appreciate it. No, I just wanted to make yeah. sure we could hear you um, and folks could hear you as well. Yeah, no problem. Sorry Great. about Thanks. that. Thanks. Okay. So, um, we should really all be working as advocates for patients with above knee amputation to get them microprocessor knee technology as much as possible. All right, so we're going to move on to MAT study four. Um, and this one's an interesting one because I think it's helpful for prosthetists, but it's also helpful for our referral sources, physicians, PTs, OTs, because it has to do with determining K levels. Um, and helping to determine kind of mobility levels for our patients. So K levels, fortunately or unfortunately, are the way that payers determine what technology our patients are allowed to have. And they can be a little bit tricky because they're not based on anything concrete. They're a little bit subjective, they're a little hard to determine, and they're hard um, in a lot of cases for our physicians, PTs, and payers to confirm in terms of uh, their K level for our patients. So can we use a tool in, um, from the data that we have to help us determine or confirm a K-level for a patient if we're looking at some objective measures? And what we found is that we can. We actually used a regression analysis to look at what factors were most important in helping determining if a patient is a limited or an unlimited community ambulator. So a limited community ambulator would be a K1 or a K2 patient, and an unlimited uh, community ambulator would be K3 or K4. And so we used uh, the, the factors that we found were most helpful in determining those decisions were the age of the patient, the weight, of the patient, the etiology of amputation, and then their plus MT score, which again are all objective measures and all of us actually have access to all of those tools so we can use this. And it was able, this model was able to determine um, limited or unlimited community ambulation in about 80% of our cases. So let's go through just a really quick little example here. Um, I named our example patient Matt because I thought it was funny since we're talking about the Matt studies. Um, he's a 62 year old male. He has a plus M score of 45.5. His cause of amputation is cancer, and his weight is 70 kilograms. So we start all the way up here at node one. This is all the patients for the entire study. And then we determine where, whether their plus M score is above or equal to 36.75, and ours is. We go over here to this node. Then we look at the patient's age, 
and he's over 58.8. So we go over here. Uh, then we look again at his plus M score, and he's actually below that threshold. So he goes over to here. And then the last one in this case is the cause of amputation, and that's cancer. And so if we look at this node, it tells us that the probability of Matt being an unlimited community ambulator um, or K3 or K4 level is 90.6%. So I think most of us would feel pretty comfortable if that were the case, feeling like this person is a, an unlimited community ambulator. There's certainly nodes on here that lead to more of a 50-50 solution, um, or even you know maybe the patient would be on the other side. So maybe they're in the 20% um, probability of being a K3, K4 ambulator. Those are the patients that we have to look at again and determine you know, if they're 50-50, are they somewhere in the middle? Do we need to do some more um, outcomes testing? How do we kind of determine what their K level is? And if they're on the low end, let's say they're 20%, there still is a 20% chance that they're going to be a K3 or K4 level ambulator. But what's the difference for that specific patient that might actually push them over the edge rather than being an 80% limited community ambulator? So the conclusions from this study are that age plus MT score, cause of amputation, and weight were factors that contributed to determining ambulation potential. And we can use that algorithm um, to help our other healthcare providers to to determine, assess, and predict mobility levels. Um, again, we're not quite, these are all for patients that currently have a prosthesis. All the patients that have the prosthesis, um, are, they're the only ones that can actually do the plus M. So this isn't predicting K level for patients that don't have a prosthesis yet, but maybe they're coming in for their second prosthesis and their mo mobility has changed, or maybe they've improved quite a bit since they got their first one. This is a good way to look at their, um, their mobility. All right. So MAT5, the impact of common prosthetic ankle foot categories for individuals with diabetic or dysvascular amputation. So, you know, if we look at K3 users and we look at specifically diabetic or dysvascular users, we see a huge variety of feet that are used in those patients. Um, and, we're, you know, is there a difference in those feet? Are we, are we providing more mobility with a certain type of foot than another one? Um, and so what we did was we looked at over 700 patients and we looked at five different categories of K3 feet. Um, this is actually our largest group of patients, diabetic patients that are K3 level ambulators. is actually our largest group of evidence that we have currently. So we were able to get a pretty big group of patients in that, um, in that survey. So um, we looked at 5980 and 81, which are flex walk and uh, flex foot feet. The 5968, which is a hydraulic ankle foot. 5987 is a vertical loading pylon and then microprocessor feet, which are a fairly new class of feet. And what we did was that we just mapped the type of foot as, re as it relates to the patient's T-score or their mobility. And so if you look all the way to the left, the microprocessor feet users actually had the highest mobility overall. Next to them are the vertical loading pylon feet. Next to that is the hydraulic ankle feet. And next to that is the flex walk and the flex foot feet. Um, and so, you know, there's a couple things. This is a correlation. It's not a causation graph. But why is this happening? Why are we seeing a higher level mobility with our patients that high, have higher level technology? Is it possible that the patient's foot is actually improving their mobility when they go out into the community? I think that's possible, depending on what um, sort of features that, that patient has with that foot. They may actually start to improve their mobility, or maybe they're doing things that they weren't doing before. There's also a chance that the prosthetist that's determining what foot style goes on a patient has a pretty good idea of what this patient's gonna do out, out and about. And so maybe they're good at determining which patients are gonna be a little bit higher level K3 and more mobile. And so they put them in the more advanced technology and maybe they have an idea of who's gonna be a little bit less mobile and they put them in a little lower technology. I think it's probably a little bit of both um, happening. Again, it's, it's not causation, it's a correlation here. But we actually found that 5980 and 5981 feet were the most commonly used feet, but they showed the lowest mobility scores overall. And patients that have a microprocessor foot have the highest level of mobility followed by the vertical loading pylon feet in this population. So maybe as prosthetists, we need to start thinking about not just starting at sort of the low end level of feet, a 59 or a 5980 or an 81, maybe we need to start at the higher end and start to exclude those feet for you know, build height maybe or the patient's tolerance for them or whatever it is to make sure that we're maximizing those patients' uh, mobility. All right, so on to the last one. This is MAT6, uh, mobility, satisfaction, and quality of life um, along, 
among long-term dysvascular or diabetic prosthesis users. Um, and so when we looked at the data, we found that automatically, if a patient has peripheral vascular disease, there's a known drop in quality of life. We also found that same type of drop in quality of life for lower limb amputation. So our patients that have an amputation due to vascular disease kind of have a double whammy. They get hit with both of those drops in quality of life. And so we wanted to look at that. And we also wanted to look to see if a prosthesis made a difference in that quality of life. And so we looked at 761 patients in this case. And you can see we're looking at quality of life, well-being, and satisfaction as a result of um, or compared to the time since amputation. And let's look a little bit closer at the quality of life because all three graphs are actually fairly similar. So if you look at this graph, the x-axis is the time since amputation in months and the quality of life is on the y-axis from zero to 10. Um, and the time since amputation, there's a gray bar initially and that looks at patients from zero to six months that do not have a prosthesis after their amputation. The other group that's in white is also resetting to zero to three months since amputation, but these patients have been fit with a prosthesis. And so if you look at just these first four data points, we're kind of matching these two. So zero to three months since amputation without and with a prosthesis and then four to six months without and with a prosthesis. And you can see there's a pretty big jump in quality of life. Now, in general, you can see both of those from zero to three to four to six months, both categories have a little bit of a drop in their quality of life. So we wanted to look at this further out, and we actually looked at this all the way out to seven years post-amputation. We found that quality of life was maintained at levels higher than those levels that were seen for patients without a prosthesis. And so that's important. We want to make sure that our patients are doing well after we fit them with a prosthesis, especially in our dysvascular population where there's a lot of information out there that rightfully says that patients with amputation tend to die shortly after their amputation. They're not dying from their amputation. They're dying from the severity of the disease that caused their amputation. So the amputation is a symptom of their disease. Um, it's not the cause of their death. Um, so we also wanted to look at mobility over time because, again, there's, uh, you know, some assumptions out there and maybe they're realistic assumptions that patients, you know, maybe they get their prosthesis initially and they start to walk, but as their disease progresses and as they get out further past their amputation, they're going to stop walking and their mobility levels will drop. So we actually looked at mobility levels all the way up to seven months, seven years, excuse me, post-amputation. Big asterisk here. This is a cross-sectional study. It's not a longitudinal study. So the patient that we're looking at at zero to three months is not the same patient that we're looking at seven years post-amputation. That's because we haven't been collecting data for that long. We've only been collecting data for four years. But we can still group patients based on how far out they are from amputation. And so what we're seeing is that the patients that we have that are engaged in their prosthetic rehabilitation, that are engaged in their fittings, tend to maintain a similar mobility level all the way out to seven years post-amputation. And that's a really big deal for our patients. And it could be a really big deal for our payers as well, uh, because sometimes we have payers that for better or for worse, decide that because this patient has had an amputation due to diabetes, maybe they don't need the higher levels of technology that they might be appropriate for. So the conclusion is that patients with a prosthesis report higher quality of life, satisfaction, and well-being over those without a prosthesis. Um, and, you know, quality of life continues to drop further out post-amputation for individuals that don't get a prosthesis. So we need to make sure that if, if a patient is an appropriate person to get a prosthesis, we get them fit and we get them fit as quickly as possible because we know there's a quality of life improvement once we get them in that prosthesis. And even though that initial bump goes up quite a bit and then it starts to drop off a little bit, those mobility levels are maintained all the way out to six to seven years post-amputation. So despite our popular beliefs or misbelief, um, individuals can continue to ambulate at a high level uh, post-amputation. So let's go over some conclusions here from our, set, our six studies. So we had a study initially that uh, correlated uh, quality of life and satisfaction with mobility. So improving our patient's mobility is also going to improve their quality of life and satisfaction. We have a study that talks about comorbid health and how those conditions may or may not affect our patient's mobility. We have two studies 
both for microprocessor needs and for types of prosthetic feet, but talk about how the functional mobility changes with the type of technology that the patient has. We now have a classification tree that can help provide predictive possibilities or probabilities for our mobility for our patients. And then we also have a study that talks about how vascular amputees are affected for mobility, quality of life, and satisfaction post-amputation and post-prosthetic fitting. So I want to give you guys some resources because I think that these are really valuable. Um, the MAT studies and our outcomes collection information is available to anybody if you guys are interested at um, hangerclinic.com slash research. We weren't able to attach the MAT studies to the webinar because there are six of them and we're only allowed five attachments and we didn't want to pick our five favorites. So we're, um, we are going to have this link in an email during the follow-up. Um, so that'll get sent out to you guys if you want to use it. There's also a really nice summary of the MAP studies. I think it's just one through five because six hadn't been published at that point by Phil Stevens. He's one of the primary authors on every single MAP study. So if you wanted to look at that, that was published in the OMP Edge. It gives you a really good rounded, well-rounded view of those without having to dig in and read um, clinical research if you're not interested in that. And then there's a link there for the Plus M online tool. It's free. There are multiple versions available. It tells you how to score everything. So if you're looking to increase the outcomes collection in your clinic in whatever way possible, this is a really good way to do it. It's an easy thing. We use the 12 question Plus M, but there are different lengths of questions if you want to make it a little bit longer or a little bit shorter. So I think we have, we do have a little bit of time for some questions and answers. Lily, do you have anybody that might have some questions for us? Hey, Erin, thanks so much. That was a lot of great information there um, for this group. We did have quite a few questions come through. So actually, this one might be good. Um, if you go back a few slides for me to the one that's got MAT1 through MAT6 and the specific conclusions, there we go. Mm -hmm. And that might help folks too as we're talking through this. So I saw a couple of questions come in from the ONT side and then maybe for, oh, sorry, uh, some from therapists at the same time. Um, so I'm wondering if we can kind of tackle it in two different ways. Sure. So let's see, uh, how can we use what we learned about the MAT studies today and apply it clinically? And I would say maybe speaking to the ONP audience a little bit to start, and then we'll go over to Allied Health and physicians maybe in that same vein. Um, so you want to start yeah. there? Sure. Yeah. So I think um, I think clinically in terms of decision making, probably the studies that have for for an ONP community. Um, the studies that talk about microprocessor needs and the type of foot are going to be the ones that maybe clinically strike home for you guys the most. Really looking at the patient population that you're that you're seeing at that point and determining what's the best type of technology that could help that patient improve their mobility. Because again, if you're improving mobility, you're also improving quality quality of life and satisfaction with that life. And so, even if it's just um, a simple change of a type of foot or a type of knee, you could actually positively be impacting that patient's life in terms of their quality of life and satisfaction. I think for our, um, maybe our PT community, um, I think there are a couple things. So the comorbid health study um, that talks about the types of comorbidity that might affect or might not affect our patient's mobility, I think that could be really valuable. Um, and also the, um, the classification tree analysis in case you're in clinic and maybe you're seeing this patient and they currently have a prosthesis, but maybe they're ready for another one and your prosthetist is asking you for notes because um, we do that. Um, maybe that would be a good thing to look at because you can easily collect all that data in the clinic um, and that would allow you to kind of confirm um, or you know correlate that K level with the prosthetist notes to make sure that everything's agreeing there. Um, and then, you know, I think for a physician, Unfortunately, you get to know all of it. <laughs> so for the physicians in the audience, I think, um, you know, understanding how mobility and quality of life and satisfaction are correlated. So if you have a patient that is lacking mobility for whatever reason, maybe looking a little bit more closely about, about what we could do to possibly improve that. Um, certainly the understanding about vascular amputation and how that um, can apply to patients up to seven years post amputation that they may maintain their mobility um, so that you can set realistic expectations for those patients. You know, um, it's important, again, to understand that, that there's a whole wide range of vascular amputees. 
Um, and some of them are going to do better and some of them are going to do worse. Um, but just because they're an amputee due to a vascular condition doesn't mean that they're not going to be mobile. Does that help answer those questions, I hope? Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. There's another one too that I think is in reference to, it was earlier, um, so I think it's in reference to MAT1. So the plus M and, um, Oh, it's, it's whenever you were going over the uh, that the collection data that we have. So probably, oh, sure. you know, the first I can go back up. slide. Uh, yeah. So around the me program, I think, and the uh, the scorecard and all that good stuff. That slide, yeah. I think. So Maybe right the question here. here uh, let me see. Go back one. Oh, right there. Right there. That one's probably the one to kind of stop on. Okay. So okay. the question here was the plus M and PEQ are subjective. Do you have any objective measures you use? Mm, that's a good question. So the plus M has actually been correlated with objective measures. When it was actually made initially, the plus M was run in conjunction with uh, the AMP Pro and the AMP No Pro to um, make sure that it was a reliable and valid study. So, um, you know, when we're collecting outcomes, we have to weigh a whole bunch of different things. We have to make sure that it's not too um, invasive or too time consuming for our patients. We have to make sure that our practitioners can administer these um, equally to all of our patients and they have to understand how to do them and that they have the time in the clinic to be able to do them. So while we do use objective measures in clinic, you know, maybe we have a, um, a tug or, um, you know, an AMP Pro or something like that, those are all, people are encouraged to do all of those. On a national level, what we are asking people at the very least to do is to collect this type of data. And since we know that the plus M does relate to actual functional mobility, that there was an initial study that went through and validated that, we feel pretty good about using the plus M. Um, and quality of life and satisfaction, there's not really an objective way to measure that. It, it is subjective. It has to do with how the patient is feeling about it. So. Um, Yes and no is the answer to that. Um, in terms of our outcomes, we do have some, some objective data, but yes, these are subjective measures because it's the patient that's filling them out. Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, I did mm -hmm. see another one, and I think you just answered it honestly, um, but do you recognize AMP, no pro, and AMP Pro as a valid objective method of assisting with predicting K levels? Oh, um, so I would have to look back at the, the article. Um, AMP Pro and AMP No Pro are absolutely used in our clinics. Um, we try to do them on all of our patients um, that come into clinic if we can. Um, and, you know, again, a lot of that has to do with the time that we have to spend with patients in a clinic, but it's a great way to determine kind of how they're doing functionally in a, in a more objective way. Um, do they absolutely predict K levels? I don't know that the correlation between their score and the K level is absolutely 100% strong. Again, I'd have to go back and look at the research again to, to determine. I know there's, there is a correlation there, but I don't know that you can absolutely just say they scored this on the AMPRO, they're absolutely a K3 level. Um, but in, the, in a patient that doesn't have a prosthesis yet, if you're really kind of on the fence, you're not quite sure what to do, that AMP No Pro can really give you a lot of information on trying to determine a K level for somebody that doesn't yet have a prosthesis because they can't do the plus M, so we're missing some of that data on those patients. Great. And then another question too, um, just to kind of clarify for folks, also this might be helpful to hear. So curious, who you have conducted PEQ and plus M? Is it conducted by an independent entity and not the treating prosthetist? Oh, actually it's um, done by the patient. So we have a couple of different ways that it is um, administered depending on um, kind of the technology that's available in the actual clinic. So both of these are self-report um, types of surveys. And so um, in certain clinics, um, it's a paper form that patients fill out. They, it, it says explicitly, you know, if this is your very first time in our clinic, fill out pages one, two, and three. If it's just 
you're coming back for a follow-up or something like that, fill out just this one page. So we tell them exactly what type of information we need from them on which pages. So they actually fill that out, usually in our lobby, or you know, maybe they come in for a follow-up appointment and we have some time, some sort of downtime where the prosthetist is working on their prosthesis and the patient is sitting in a patient room. They can then take that outcomes measure while they're sitting there. The PEQ, um, same way, it's on that same form. In a lot of our clinics, we've actually moved to electronic uh, versions of this, which is really nice because the patient gets a text message two days prior to their patient appointment that tells them that they have a survey that we'd like them to fill out that has to do with their, their mobility. And so they can go in on their own time and fill all that out and it sends it back to us automatically into our secure EHR system. Um, if they don't do that, we have a tablet in the clinic that they can fill it out on before they come into the patient room or while they're in the patient room waiting for us. So it's the patient that's actually filling those out and that's how those studies are meant to be um, done, um, their patient report. So the, the plus M has questions like, um, you know, over the past two weeks on this scale, how easy has it been for you to walk two blocks? Or um, how difficult would it be for you to walk two miles including hills on uneven terrain. And those are very different you know, questions. So you're gonna get a whole broad range of answers um, from all different mobility levels. And that plus M you're talking about, that one's on that website you included on that last slide, right? They can find that it publicly is. available. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. great. Yep, it's at and we'll, uh, plus we'll M.org. We'll that for you guys too at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, another question here. The, um, is the functional classification tree a published tool for physical therapists to use? Yes. So all of these studies have been published, and you can find that, uh, that little tree. Where is it? In that study. It is published in the study, and you can just follow along. That one right there. You can follow right along with it. So all you would need were those four types of data, three of which you probably already have pretty easily, age, weight, etiology. You probably already have those in your patient notes anyway. So you just add that plus M T score, which again, you can do at plus M.org, um, and they tell you how to score it there and everything. You can add that one type of objective information, and then that allows you to use this tree. So yes, it is published. It's available. Please use it. That's what it's there for. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we do still have time for some more questions. So let me just a few more and then um, I'll pass it back to you to kind of closing closing remarks here. Um, let's see. Oh, this one is a good one. Are these measures for lower extremity amputations or does the plus M, which I'm assuming um, she might be asking about, um, have questions about upper extremity function? You know, this is just lower extremity. We have other um, outcomes measures that we're using for our upper extremity amputee, amputees as well. Um, we use questions from the PROMISE, um, and we do use the, um, the PEQ because that's not specific to lower extremity, at least the well-being section is not. Um, so we have a completely separate set of outcomes measures that we collect for our upper limb um, users. Um, so Yes, we're collecting data, but it's not exactly the same data that we're collecting here. We're also collecting data on AFO users. We're collecting data in all sorts of different um, categories, it's just that these are the ones that got published first, because this is where we actually started collecting data first, is the lower extremity amputees. Great. Perfect. All right. So let's see. I do have one last one here. Oh, if I'm not a part of Hanger Clinic, what resources are available to help make my make sure my patients are benefiting from the best care possible? Yeah, that's a really good question because it's like, okay, it's all well and good that you guys have all these tools available to you. Um, we've kind of gone over some of this. Um, definitely the plus M is available. All of these studies are available. So if you have questions about, you know, how a certain type of foot might affect your patient's mobility or um, you're having trouble classifying their K level, those resources are out there. Um, there are tons of outcomes, um, data collection types of um, resources that are out there. The, plus, uh, the AMP Pro, the AMP No Pro, those are all available for free as well. Um, so use the, the outcomes that you see are most beneficial for your patients, um, but collect them in a way that is repeatable over time because 
if you do different outcomes for each of your patients, it's really hard to go back and compare those later. So the thing that I think that's been so strong about this and the, the reason we've been able to publish these is that from the outset, we decided this is the data that we're going to collect because it's going to give us this information. And then we were able to look at all these different sort of um, different variables, different reasons for why something might happen, something might not happen. Um, but that's why we were able to do this. So whatever resources you guys decide to find, use them and use them reliably over over the course of many months or many years so that you can go back and look at that data not only for just the patient the individual patient so they can see what they did six months ago or in six months but for your population so again it's all about empowering your person your patient but also empowering a larger group of people great perfect thanks so much Erin um just mm -hmm. last I guess last question here for you you know, what, what makes these studies so unique? Um, I know Hanger Clinic and Hanger is, is doing so many kind of publishing and so many different um, research out there today. I'm wondering mm -hmm. what makes this one, this series really unique, just from your experience and, you know, learning about them and the presenting to folks around the country on, on yeah. the studies themselves. I think there are a couple of things that make it really powerful. So one is just the number of patients that we're actually able to include in a study. Um, we, we range from 500 or so all the way up to 760, I think is the last um, in MAT6, the number of patients that were included. And it is really almost unheard of to be able to get that many patients in, um, in a study um, in any sort of way um, for in prosthetics and orthotics. You know, there, if you're looking at, let's say, the relative number of patients with diabetes, that's a very large number. There's something like 34 million people that, um, that have diabetes in the United States. That's a huge number. So getting a, a group together of 590 of those might not be a big deal for you know, regular diabetic research, for, but for the field or for orthotics and prosthetics, we're, we're kind of a small niche group of patients and providers having this large number of patients available is a huge deal. So sort of using our, you know, the number of clinics that we have available, the number of patients and practitioners we have available, we kind of leverage that into these large studies. Um, I think the other thing that's um, really cool about these is that sort of each study builds on the next one. So again, we started really, really simple. Does mobility and satisfaction and mobility and quality of life, do those correlate in any way? And we thought we knew the answer, but in science, it's not enough to think that you know the answer. You have to actually study those answers. Um, and so, you know, we start really simple, and then we start to build more complexity and add a little bit more color, and then we start to look at component choice. Um, and again, there, there are just things about that type of um, that study that you cannot see any other place. So I think that's what makes these ones a little bit different. They are all retrospective, so some patients, uh, some people might think that maybe those aren't quite as strong as a retrospective study or, um, you know, something that maybe would take place in a lab and you have really strong uh, control of all the variables. But these are more, I feel like, real life. These are our patients that are actually, um, we're getting the data from them. They're living their everyday lives. We're getting it over a long period of time. Um, and that's a study that, that would be really, really hard to do in, um, in sort of a laboratory setting. Mm -hmm. Great. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Erin. And, you know, a, a comment that came in, I just want to kind of read to you, um, you know, such a great way to utilize big data here from Hanger and just so unique in us being able to, to share this with this group here today and, and having it published and available for you guys to utilize as a resource. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, this is a reminder um, to make sure um, we are uh, sharing this with you guys. We are going to have the slides available for you all following the session. So we'll have that for you. We'll also send you the links for these um, published studies here on our website. And you can download them as well, have them handy, and we'll send um, anything else that we've got as follow up for you all. So thank you again, Erin, for joining us. I do appreciate yeah. it. Um, any any final, you know, closing out your uh, your session with these guys? No, I just really appreciate everybody being here today. Um, I think we had, I don't know, 300 people on the call or something like that. So mm -hmm. that's amazing mm -hmm. that you guys took time out of your day to spend a few, a few minutes of it with me. I really appreciate it. Um, 
if anybody has questions, certainly feel free to reach out to Lily um, and she can get them to me if there are other questions that maybe you think of afterwards, I'd be happy to help out. And that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. All right, so remember just as an FYI, you guys will see that credit will request come through to you via email. I'm gonna try and get it out to you as soon as possible this afternoon or tomorrow because it does include a quiz on this fun stuff. So um, I'll try and I get try it out to make you it guys hard. soon. Yay. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thanks again for joining and we'll see you guys next time. Bye now. All right. Thank you.